do. <laughs> I'm going to bring up the amazing Joyce here. Welcome back. Thank you. It's so nice to be here. <laughs> Yay. Thank you all for coming. It's so nice to see you. Really appreciate you coming out tonight. So I've been a medical intuitive since 1987, and I didn't think I was going to be a medical intuitive. I thought I was going to be a gardener. I got my degree in horticulture. And then, you know, life can change and turn on a dime, and mine did. Had an injury to my back, and whew, you know, next thing I knew, I was spending a lot of time meditating and interpreting my dreams and praying, you know, dear, if I could just live through this night, and, <laughs> and <clears throat> finding a place where I could be alone with my thoughts, and before I knew it, I started having these sensations, and the empathy in my body arose, so that I could tell what was going on with the health and healing of other people. It was kind of weird. At, start, at the start, I would be in line at a grocery store, and I would start to feel kidney pain. I'd think, oh my God, what's going on here, you know, and then I would uh, change lines, and that would go away, and then over here it'd be like splitting headache on the left side. You know, I'm thinking, what is going on? And anyway, I finally learned how to manage it, and it now long, no longer troubles me in that way. But it was a kind of a you know rocky start. We never know what life is going to bring up for us, and um, there can be so many uh, things that happen. And so just I've learned to just kind of go with the flow and roll with it, and things will all generally work out for the best in the long run. So there were several things that I wanted to talk about tonight uh, about health and healing. That, and most all of these have come through my own. You're looking at my teacher right here. <laughs> this is my body. It's my teacher. It has taught me so much about how to be in the world. And um, the first thing that I wanted to mention was that I happened to um, stumble onto a foolproof cure for poison oak. And this was a big event for me in my life because I have always had a sweet tooth uh, ever since I was a little girl. And so some of you may know that when you do have a sweet tooth, you tend to have higher blood sugars, or at least they can spike from time to time. And that can increase the inflammation in your body. And it can also increase what's known as the C-reactive proteins. And those are the marker that is in our blood for inflammation. And even though I don't tend to get allergies or other symptoms of inflammation necessarily, I would get this horrible case of poison oak at least once or maybe twice a year. My whole arm would just swell up like a big sausage, you know, I mean, just awful. And I would have to, you know, be in a cool, dark room with hardly any clothing on. I couldn't go out socially or anything like that. So it was a real big event in my life. And instead of lasting the usual two weeks that it would normally last for someone, a uh, case of poison oak for me would be more like two months. It was just awful. So I was like, oh. So when I finally came upon this cure, I was so relieved. And it happened quite by accident. My husband, Frank, who's sitting in the back there, we went out to dinner one night at our favorite Mexican restaurant. And we're sitting there, and I've got my arms on the table, you know, and I'm not thinking too much about it. And we got some enchiladas, I think, or something. And, and uh, later that night, I started to feel that very distinctive signature itch. Now they say you can't get poison oak from tables and chairs or dogs and cats, but I can. And those of us who get it really bad know that you can actually. And it has a distinct feeling to it. And also the way the little bumps come up is very distinctive. So apparently somebody who had been dining at that table probably just before me had maybe been working out in the brush all day and had it on their clothes or on their skin or something. And but that wasn't the only thing that happened to me that night. I also happened to get a little touch of food poisoning. Actually, not a little touch. It was a pretty good touch. So I wound up spending the night losing my cookies and both ends, and it was like, oh, this is so uncomfortable. And um, then the next day, I thought, okay, so now I've got poison oak, and I feel like heck because I've been up all night. Um, I'm just going to green juice cleanse to kind of, that's a great way to kind of come out of food poisoning is to give your whole digestive tract a rest. And just let it rest. So I was drinking green juice. And so, you know, green juice, la -da -da, you know, our dark leafy green. So I brought a little uh, demonstration garden here. Anybody know what this one is? Here's another one. Chard. Yeah, Swiss chard, right. And then this nice, lovely flowering beauty right now in the garden. Arugula. Yeah. Yep. Arugula. And then here is, you know, the the prince of foods. Yeah. 
Talk about your dark leafy green. Isn't that beautiful? Look how dark that is. So the dark greens, you know, those are very rich in calcium. Isn't that lovely? So there's the kale. And then here's one that uh, Frank and I have been growing lately. A couple of you have already guessed what this is. Parsley? Celery. 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 Yeah, celery. Isn't that great? So, and the outer leaves of celery plants are very dark and very full. Usually what we get in the market, you know, they've stripped off all those outer leaves to get to that main stalk that's so nice and juicy and succulent in the middle. But boy, these dark outer greens, if you're a juicer, mmm, yum, really nice, so easy to grow in the garden. So I went ahead and made myself some, some vegetable juice, and I, and I, you know, drank it all day long, just a little bit, you know, maybe, I don't know, I usually make like a quart, and so might might have a pint in the morning, half a pint in the afternoon, half a pint in the evening, something like that. And I, I basically water fasted other than that. And my digestive tract started to feel much better, much relieved, and I was so surprised to find out that instead of rising up in the usual way that those little poison oak bumps would do, starting to really take hold, ta-da, ta-da, they instead diminished and started to go away. I thought, wow, what's that about? How lucky am I, you know? And so then the next day I thought, well, I'll have another day of green juicing, so I did. I started off with another, you know, pint in the morning. And then around, I don't know, in the afternoon, Frank walked by with some cashews or something, and I thought, oh, uh, maybe I'll just, have, I'll just have a couple of cashews. And I took a couple of cashews, maybe four or five, and about 15 minutes later, lo and behold, these little bumps started to get a little more itchy again. They started to get a little more <laughs> And then about two hours later, they had kind of calmed down again. So then I had some more green juice. Next day, I thought, you know, I'm going to go another day with this green juice here. One of the nice things about the green juice is if you're drinking it all day long, you actually have tons of energy and you don't go into that hypoglycemic, you know, that low blood sugar. If you're sipping it all day long, it keeps your energy kind of even, but you kind of have to go through a lot of it. So by the second or third day, I was starting to go for more like two quarts a day or three quarts a day so that I wouldn't go into a low. And boy, I felt fabulous. My energy was high. So third day, here I am. I'm going strong on my green juice. I'm up to three quarts or something. It felt great. Then I think the fourth day, I thought, I think again, Frank walked by. I think he had some little saltine crackers or something. And I thought, ooh, that's looking mighty good. Had some, oh my gosh, you know, refined carbohydrate, almost like white sugar, you know. Up they came, hard and fast. And then those um, refined carbohydrates, you know, they transit slowly through the digestive tract. They don't have a lot of that soluble fiber. So that took about 10 or 15 hours before this calmed down. And then it did. And then I thought, oh my gosh, I think I've discovered the cure. <laughs> so then I went ahead and went on a two-week green juice fast which was wonderful. I had plenty of energy. I felt like a million bucks. But if I ate anything, did I pay? So, and, you know, if I was to itch, you know, I mean, if I was to scratch, I mean, I've known friends who've, like, taken a hairbrush to their poison. I, that, you know, you just send me, you might as well just hospitalize me. In fact, I have been hospitalized for poison oak before. So, and then I thought, well, gosh, that worked out so well for me. I had another friend who got out of the car, and there was some deciduous poison oak. She didn't know it, but she put her face right in it oh, and her hands, so and she gets it pretty bad, too. Not as bad as I have, but because it is a progressive disease. Every time you get it, it gets just a little worse. It's how some of those allergies will build. Your body gets super reactive to it. And so I said, hey, this is what I did. So she did it, worked great. Now, she wasn't quite as sensitive to it, so she found that she could eat an egg every day, one or two eggs, soft-boiled or hard-boiled, and it worked out great for her because that's, again, a kind of a, it's not a high glycemic food. It's not like a potato or a bag of chips or something like that. So she did fine with that. And now I've since had, you know, I don't know, half a dozen friends who have had poison oak and have done this cure, and it works great. So what we're talking about here is inflammation, right? This is what is the, so all, all of your allergies, that's all inflammation. Mm -hmm. All of the, so if there are some people who feel like, who feel that just about every cause of every disease is, has its roots in inflammation. Inflammation is one of those huge problems for people. Let's say you injured a knee or something. 
you know, it's going to be a lot worse if you have an inflammatory situation or if you have the viruses, you know, it's going to, sugars and things are going to increase that as well, which kind of results in an inflammatory situation in the body. So cooling the body down. I had an a acupuncturist here in town. Some of you may have known, may know her, Jean Yu. Mm -hmm. She has since retired. Mm -hmm. She used to say to me when I would come in with my poison oak, she would say, house too hot. <laughs> Isn't that a great way to look at it? House too hot. It's hot in here, actually. Is it? Do you want a door open? Uh -huh. Yeah, we could do that. Let's see about. It. Is that all right, Michelle? If I open this door over here? I feel cold. I feel cold. A cold breeze coming through here. Okay, it's a cold breeze back there. Should I still open this, you guys? Yo, oh, you're cold. Okay, we'll leave that cold. If you want to get cooler, I would say either move over to this chair here or in the back. Back here, yeah. back here it's really cold. It's from being a horticulturist. It's from being a horticulturist. <laughs> so one other thing about, uh, about um, inflammation is that, you know, with uh, many of the studies that they've done, the medical studies, a lot of the times in the past they've used men as the test subjects because they felt, well, women, childbearing and whatnot, we don't want to really do the testing on the women. So they have found that, you know, the main opinion of, of the cause for heart attack has traditionally or been in the recent years a plaque accumulated in the, in the veins and arteries of the heart, especially the arteries. But they, when they started doing tests with women more recently in the last 15 or 20 years, they actually found that the main cause for women for heart attack is inflammation. What happens is there's a little disruption in the inside of that epithelial layer, the skin layer inside the vein or the inside the artery, let's say. And then what happens in, in, in women is we tend to swell. We tend to get a swelling. So that nice round artery starts to get a swelling, and that is what causes the breaking off. So that's why when you go to the doctor and they say, let's do some blood work, let's see how your C-reactive protein levels are. That's one of the things they're looking for is those high C-reactive protein levels. So dropping our blood sugars on, on a regular basis, which I found that beautiful way to do it with green juice, um, and there are, of course, a myriad, I mean, that's kind of like the extreme. Here's, here's your sugar diet, sugar and donuts all day long, and here's your green juice diet, right? So there's any number of places in between where you can find a nice happy balance for yourself. So um, we know those foods that are high glycemic foods, right? White bread, white sugar, um, potatoes, pasta especially, um, those are going to be pretty high up there. Then the low glycemics are over here on your, you know, uh, broccoli, cauliflower, that sort of thing. So let's just hear some vegetables that you know of that are low glycemic vegetables, if you can just, do you have any ideas? Celery. Yes. Spinach. Yes. Asparagus. Right on. Brussels sprouts. Yeah. <laughs> yes. A little higher, but yeah, but beets are a little sweeter. Think of beets and carrots. They're kind of in that medium mm -hmm. glycemic. Not as high as an apple, but in the middle. So maybe some more that are low. Bok choy. Mm -hmm. Zucchini. Zucchini. Yes, exactly. Lettuce. Yeah, Brussels sprouts, lettuce, yep. How about eggs? Now that's getting into an animal base, and yes, low glycemic. But I was thinking of vegetables right now, oh. but that's okay. Leafy greens. The all your leafy greens, yeah. Artichokes. Yeah, they're a little starchy. You can tell there's a little starchiness in there. It's probably in the medium glycemic. Yeah. Anybody else have any thoughts or ideas? Oh, tomatoes. What are yeah. So tomatoes. That's kind of slightly sweet, depending on how tomato sweet the tomato is. So that's probably in the medium range. Mm -hmm. Green beans. Yeah, green beans, again, getting a little starchy. Sugar snap peas, also a little starchy. But, you know, if you don't have a problem with uh, poison oak or you don't really need to drop your glycemic level that much, you could put some of those in your juice, and they'd be very nice in there. So um, it was just a really interesting experience for me because I wound up with not only clean, you know, when we do these kind of juice fe feasts like that, we really do clean our organs quite tremendously. And when we have clean organs, we wind up with a cleaner mind. Just makes mm -hmm. sense, right? If you have a congested colon and your blood is circulating around and your liver gets congested because it can't get everything cleaned out all the time, and then your blood goes up to your brain, you know, <laughs> it's trying to feed the brain some dirty blood. So that's uh, one of the main reasons why we want to clean our organs on a regular basis, which Frank and I do. We like to do these Dr. Schultz cleanses. And I've shared with these before in the past. They're awfully nice. So 
He's got his five-day liver cleanse, his five-day bowel cleanse, and his five-day kidney cleanse. Those are the main organs of el elimination. And then he also has his 30-day detox. And there's any number of cleanses that you can do. You don't just have to do Dr. Schultz's, but something to kind of, like, like, you know, if you had a car, you would change the oil from time to time. Same thing holds true for our bodies. We want to clean them out from time to time. Just give them a little break. So that's what my little experience. Just ask a quick question. Sure. What about doing soups? Because, like, I, I spent are great. three weeks at Optimum and Health Institute, and yep. I got weaker every day. So yeah. I couldn't handle right. the juicing. That's right. So if you do it in soups. Exactly. And also, too, everybody is different. Mm -hmm. So... Um, what's going to work for one person might not work for another person. You know, somebody might have a great, great success using kava kava as an herb. I take kava kava and my throat swells shut, you know. <laughs> Clearly not my herb, <laughs> you know. So we're all different. You know, some people will die from eating a strawberry or peanuts. So, so paying attention to your own body needs is really important. And I, I passed out a little self-care checklist. And this is just arbitrary, you know, I've, I've done these self-care checklists for years because if I'm trying to do something to change my situation to help my teacher feel better, mm -hmm. then I'll come up with something. So um, this one has, you know, spiritual things, meditation, morning prayers, writing, 30 conscious breaths, um, healthy images, singing, whistling, humming, that sort of thing. That's sort of in the spiritual category up at the top. And then activities. Oh, well, but I do do dancing you know, a couple of times a week, definitely. <laughs> but, um, but stretching, you know, there's activities, and then, uh, you know, healthy support, you know, going to some of your wonderful alternative, like, well, like physical therapy or um, acupuncture or whatever it might be, massage. So this is just an arbitrary list, but I I'm pass this out just to give everybody an idea of what we can create on our own, a nice healthy healing checklist like that. And um, I'm doing one right now. It's different from this one, but I get out my checklist every day at the e I go through it and I try to keep an eye on it during the course of the day to make sure I'm doing the different things that I want to do. It's just one other way that we can love ourselves and that we can empower ourselves and take charge of our own health and healing. So, and then you were just mentioning healing soups, and I was just going to go there next oh, okay, because <laughs> there's a no, it was great because there is a great uh, old time healer, and this was my mother's book. It's beautiful old book. It's called Food is Your Best Medicine by Henry Beeler. Uh, Blow the dust off the top. <laughs> but um, this was back in the day when doctors used to make house calls, you know, back in the 50s. And um, what he would do for people who had diabetes or um, nowadays, I, I've certainly found this to be very helpful for many of my clients who call who maybe have fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue, is what's known as Beeler broth. And so this one is a little higher glycemic because it has green beans in it. So you take green beans, celery, zucchini, and parsley in roughly equal parts. And you chop them up coarsely and you put them in a pot, stainless steel or glass is best for cooking with, and cover it with water, bring it to a boil, let it cool, blend it, and then have four days of bed rest and taking only that Beeler broth. Mm -hmm and you will find a tremendous turnaround for most everybody. So some of the folks who will call with really bad fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue are just astounded when at the end of four days they're like, hey, I feel pretty good, I can move around, <laughs> look, this is great, I don't have any pain, what happened? So there's some nice old-fashioned healing tips and when we learn about these things and can begin to use them for ourselves, it's like what Michelle was talking about empowering ourselves with our alternatives, with our learning how to take good care of ourselves. So again, you know, the physical therapy and this uh, physical exercise, I personally like to get out, get hot and pink and sweaty, you know, five times a week at least, for at least an hour a, a day, and you know, it's a wonderful thing to be able to move our bodies, and, and that's part of how we stay healthy, is through our exercise. Uh, let's see. So then I also wanted to talk a little bit about food combining. And you have a chart like this. This is sort of the more complex version. And I found, and for my body, that a plant-based diet is probably the best for me because it just really helps the foods to move through my body quicker. Um, but not, and that's not going to hold true for everybody. Now, now, I do eat a little bit of eggs and a little bit of cheese. Not much, just a little bit. <clears throat> Maybe two eggs a week, usually, I would say, and maybe two slices of cheese a week, probably. And I'm, that may change. 
but that's what I'm currently doing. Um, the meats don't do so well for me. They just move too slowly through my system. And how can I tell? Well, the other end, right? It's, it's, you know, it's just not that comfortable, a little smelly, not so good. So, um, but with the plant-based diet, we generally tend to have a much quicker transition through the body. Uh, maybe 12 hours for if a person is eating mostly only fruits and vegetables or some nuts and seeds, that material is going to move through pretty quickly. But if you're eating a lot of animal products, there aren't very many fibers in there. It's natural fiber that the colon can actually grab a hold of and help to, with the contractions to move the food through. And so then that tends to have a slower transit time in the average body, somewhere around 24 to 36 hours. And so that kind of makes for more putrefaction, increases the quantity of molds and bacteria that's happening in the colon. And then we were talking about that dirty blood and that dirty liver and that dirty brain. So a lot of depression and headaches and problems like that can get cleared up by just cleaning the organs of elimination. And yes? Is chicken similar to beef in that respect? Yes, it is, absolutely, yeah, uh-huh. It, it would be, not, you know, sometimes for some people a little fish is gonna move a little quicker through, especially the cold water fishes, but, um, but yeah, I think that chicken is about on the same par. And then of course I haven't eaten pork in many, many, many years just because the, the actual physical body of the pig is almost identical to our human body. The pancreas is very similar, the gut tract is very similar. Unlike a cow that has four stomachs or a horse that has a really long digestive tract or a dog or a cat that has a really short one, we're almost identical to a pig in our body type and style. And so in surgically they can actually use a lot of pig parts to substitute for human parts. And because of that, the parasites and the diseases like trichinosis that pigs get are very easily transmitted to humans. So mm -hmm. I just sort of stopped all that years ago. It's, you know, just a choice that I made. So back to food complaining. This is the more complex uh, description of it. But the basics are very simple. Fruits like to be eaten alone, especially melons. Very much like to be eaten alone. With the rest of the fruits, you can do your sweet fruits together, you can do your slightly sour, slightly acidic fruits together, and your more acidic fruits together. But they don't like, for instance, your acidic fruits don't prefer to be eaten with sweet fruits. But in general, if you're eating fruit, it's all right, you know, together. But, but just to say that there are different digestive enzymes and acids in the stomach that work on them differently. And then, as well, carbohydrates like potatoes or rice, they are fine with uh, dark with your leafy greens and you can add in some fat with that as well and then your proteins which would be your seeds or nuts or if you're eating animal products would be your chicken or your beef or your fish or whatever that also goes well with dark leaf with the darker greens and a little fat if you like the big problem with food combining is when you take carbohydrates and put them in the same stomach with proteins because what happens is there are different acids to digest a protein than there are for carbohydrates. And you put them in together and the one cancels out the other and then both sort of sit there and putrefy. But the carbohydrate will kind of step to the front of the line. Sugar always steps to the front of the line in digestion. So if you were to sit down, let's say we go out and we have a sandwich. Now most all sandwiches, unfortunately, you know, what is it, peanut butter and bread or it's a turkey sandwich, that's mixing carbohydrate and protein. And it just doesn't work out that well in the gut. And so what happens is the sugars step to the head of the line and they start to get digested first. And so then the meat or the nuts or seeds or whatever have to sit and wait. So let's say you have your potato and your chicken. Okay, so the potato is gonna get started. So maybe, maybe you eat the chicken first, okay? And out come a bunch of acids to digest the chicken. And then you put the potato in there and everybody says, uh-uh, potato first. So now we put in the potato acids, right? This chicken has to go back here and wait. And it, all of its acids have now just become ineffective. And now the potato is digesting, okay? Now you decide, gee, maybe I'll have some of that dessert. So you throw in a strawberry pie. So now that's gonna really jump to the head of the line, right? Strawberry's sweeter than potato, and so it's gonna mm -hmm. So that gets digested first, then the potato finishes up. Meanwhile, the meat is waiting, waiting, waiting. And then furthermore, the fiber content in the plant and fruit, in the vegetable, in the plant foods, is going to move through that colon faster. But the meats, the animal products, no fiber there. Meat, cheese, so it's going to really slow down. 
then we're looking at diverticuli and pockets in the colon from stuff sitting and kind of compacting in there, not getting those nice contractions to move things along. So anyway, a little bit of paying attention to food combining is a good idea. Then let's see. Um, there's another little thing. Oh, well, there's a saying about digestion that I <laughs> really like. It's kind of funny. It says that we want to uh, drink our solids and chew our liquids. So you think, what? <laughs> so drink your solids means you want to really chew it, really get it broken down so that the stomach doesn't have quite so much work to do. And then chew your liquids means you want to kind of slow down and let those enzymes in the mouth because our green juices are getting digested mostly right in our mouth. They're just going, you know, right in. By the time they've moved down the esophagus, they're practically, you know, when you're drinking green juice, it's almost like mainlining nutrition. You're just getting powerful nutrition into your body right now, right away. And so that's a nice little thing to keep in mind. So just to kind of jump into the digestive tract here. So we have our teeth, the crown jewels of the skeleton, I like to call them, and then the mouth, and then the, the wind goes down to the front, the esophagus is slightly to the back. Now, I only just recently learned this, but the esophagus is most of the time kind of closed. It sort of squishes in on itself. And then, of course, the cardiac sphincter, the top of the stomach, and the stomach, the pyloric valve at the bottom, and then we've got the small intestine, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum, right? And then there's a little place where that small intestine, that's like 23 feet long or something in the average human. Then that small intestine goes into, I mean, it's worth it to kind of go through the anatomy a little bit now and then just so that we're all familiar with our bodies, because these are our teachers. These are our spiritual vehicles in this world, so knowing them a little bit is a good idea. So then where that small intestine dumps into the large intestine, there's the three parts of the large intestine, the ascending, the transverse, and the descending colon, okay? Now where that small intestine drops into that large intestine at the bottom down here, at the bottom of the ascending colon, there's actually a little sort of an area that's slightly lower before that colon starts to rise up. And this is called the cecum. So this is the ileocecal valve. This is from the ileum going to the cecum. And that ileocecal valve can kind of catch and hold material. And guess what else is right there? Your appendix. Yeah. And now that appendix, they used to think that it was not so important, but now they're realizing that it's just really a storehouse of white blood cells. So let's say you've eaten something that's a little poisonous coming down the line, and it gets into that large intestine. Boy, those white blood cells can go and attack whatever is needed to be taken care of there. But then fortunately, that little area also catches material in that cecum. And sometimes that appendix can get blocked by some of that material that's there. And then we wind up with what? Appendicitis, yeah. So then, of course, what would you want to do if you had a little oncoming case of appendicitis and you were maybe not available to get to a, a doctor? You want to stop eating. You know, don't put anything more in there. Give everything a check. Go to some green juice if you want to or some water. But let, it, let everything settle down. So then from that, on, on we move up and across and down, and then there's the sigmoid colon where the material, the, the finally digested material starts to kind of collect, and then into the rectum where it's now getting ready for ejection. We hear that little nerve say, ooh gee, time to go, and <laughs> off we trot to the bathroom, and that's how, how it happens. So it's just nice to have a little quick review on the anatomy of the digestive tract. Now, in that small intestine, there's an amazing little structure that's called the villi, or the villus, the plural is villus. Now the villi, they look like a shag carpet, okay? T little sweeping fingers that move along, help to move the food around. Okay, these are amazing. There's 3,500 of them per square inch. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? That's a lot. And what are they doing? They're sweeping all that newly digested food that's been subjected to these acids and things, and they are categorizing it and sorting it and absorbing it and figuring out where it goes and the little capillaries in the little villa are like, okay, off this way, off that way, you know, mostly going to the liver to get sort of taken care of to provide nutrition for our bodies. Now, what happens to the villa if we are eating white flour? Do you remember making wallpaper paste with your mom mm -hmm. when you were young? Yes. Okay, uh -huh. white flour and water? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Same thing, the villa, getting a little gunked up in there, right? Too much white flour going through the system. So then another, uh, other things that are toxic to the villa, of course, some a sensitive little delicate organ like that, 
alcohol, right, antibiotics, uh, food additives, any kind of chemicals, poison, or soda pop, ooh, you know. You think if you hold it in your mouth very long and it starts to burn, think what it's going to do is it makes its 12-hour transit through the villa of the, inte of the small intestine. So there's a lot of things that are, are very hard on, on our digestion that we want to avoid. So a piece of pizza, for instance, white flour, cheese, you know, maybe some other stuff in there, food additives, preservatives, who knows, GMO. If it's white flour, it's going to have antibiotics on it because we now, if it's not organic, everything is sprayed with Roundup to increase the harvest time, and Roundup acts like an antibiotic. It is an antibiotic. So people who are here in the United States will wind up with a lot of colon problems, and they'll say, oh, I'm very sensitive, gluten intolerant. But they go to Europe, they can sit down and eat a croissant, no problem, because they're not spraying their grains with Roundup over there. <clears throat> a little different political climate. So, um, slow transit, fast transit. So what happens when our body is being subjected to these toxins and poisons in, in our digestive tract? We have this amazing wisdom to our body. So what does it do? It creates mucus to start lining that colon, a clear mucoidal plaque, they call it. And mucus begins to build up. Now, if somebody's eating a lot of these junk foods, that mucoidal plaque is going to get thicker and thicker to try to protect the villa, right? And it's going to do a good job of it. But then, of course, we can't do much absorption through that muc mucus layer, right? So we're going to have much decreased uh, uptake of nutrients. And then also, if we're eating those junk foods, we're not getting a lot of nutrients to start off with, as opposed to, say, if we're eating a lot of vegetables and fruits. So that is going to leave us feeling full, but actually starving to death, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why I think we have such a weight problem in our country, is because so many of us are filling up on foods that aren't nourishing us, and so then we're still hungry, we want more nutrition. We're, we're yearning for nutrition. So then the way to get that mucoidal plaque thinned, of course, is to start eating the foods that we know are good for us. I had a fun conversation with my brother a while back, and, and, and at the, we were talking a long time about food and how to take care of the body, and at the end of it he said, so are you trying to tell me that all the foods that we know are good for us are good for us? <laughs> and all the foods that we know are bad for us are bad for us? <laughs> I said, yeah, actually, that's what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it's true. So um, low fiber foods, you know, those are going to have a slow transit, and there's going to be a lot of putrefaction, and there's going to be molds and bacteria and things. And the high fiber foods, there's going to be very few toxins. We're going to have a thin mucoidal plaque, and we're going to have more nutrient absorption. Now there is one downside to that, which I've heard about having happened to a few people, which is you get. Let's say you've been really bad habits for a long time, and then you're like, that's it, I'm going to change, and you go completely clean, and you've been clean for six months, maybe, you know, let's say so maybe somebody was an alcoholic, and now they're completely clean, they're eating healthy, and then one night they go on a bender, and sadly they die from it. Oh. You've heard of that, right? Where somebody, like, they've been on the wagon for a long, long time, and then all of a sudden, boom, because they go back to their same old levels of eating toxic stuff, and that villa is no longer protected with that mucoidal plaque and because they have thinned it and they've become <coughs> more vulnerable. So that's just a little aside. So when you are clean, you are more sensitive. So for instance, I can't take a lot of stuff that is bad for me or I really feel it because I've gotten pretty clean. So I'm a little more sensitive than most people. So I just can't go out and have a big old bender or I'll get into trouble from it. I'll feel it. So that's one additional little bit of consideration with this. So now, um, back to poop. <laughs> okay, one of my favorite subjects. No. <laughs> so these membranes in our bodies, like our small intestine and our colon, they're not like plastic. It's not like you can put a bag of water and hold it up and it's not going to leak, right? They are semi-permeable membranes, right? They have a little bit of ability to allow things to go back and forth. Now, they are certainly good and strong, you know, and they're very much almost like plastic, but there can be a little bit of permeability. So especially if you've got a slow-moving 
bunch of food or, or material going through a colon and that thing is starting to not move very well because there's not enough fiber, it's not contracting well. And it can um, begin to pocket or get kind of hard, you know, sometimes people will actually form little bits of plaque in there. We've, we've all had an experience with a really bad dose of constipation and there's been something really hard. You know, and sometimes things, in, in, in certain situations, you can actually get old material chipping off of the inside of the colon wall and it can actually tear. There's situations that now, that's an emergency surgery, and thank God for the surgeons who can come in and stitch us up quickly because, and clean it out, because otherwise septicemia, boy, that person is toast pretty quick. So taking care of our colons and keeping them moving and keeping the material moving through our bodies is a really good idea. And um, so these semi-permeable membranes, uh, you know, here's, we've got this waste pipeline going through a great recreational area, you know, so you got to wonder, you know, so there's the, all of our reproductive organs are here, and so we want to take care for them, because if we have putrefaction going on in that area, and then that's leaching into the area of the ovaries or the uterus or the, the testes, um, we can wind up with hormonal imbalances happening in those areas of our bodies, and um, infertility issues. So, uh, you know, one of the best ways for people who are suffering from infertility problems to go ahead and naturally empower themselves towards being able to conceive a child is to really clean up their bodies. And when they go through and clean their organ mm -hmm. systems and get a really healthy diet and getting lots of exercise, then usually, voila, nature takes care of it and things will happen along those lines where they will conceive. So now there are some wonderful herbs that can be taken. Um, I'm, like I said, a big fan of Dr. Schultz, his intestinal formula number one. Believe me, if you're suffering from constipation, this is <laughs> this will take care of that, and quick. And uh, a much more gentle, but certainly widely available, smooth move tea at the healthy food store. Great, you know, and these all have the same herbs in them. These are uh, herbs that were used originally in the veterinary industry. So, uh, Cascara Sagrada and Senapod and Leaf. Those will make a dead horse poop, and I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, things are gonna come out of there. <laughs> so, same holds true for us. Only we don't need anywhere near the dose. What was that? Quite a picture. <laughs> yeah, I know. Sorry about that, but it's the truth. <laughs> so, um, and I, I have one cat who has said she was uh, the seventh in the litter, and she was the runt, and her actually the eighth cat actually didn't make it and died, you know. So she has colon problems, this little girl. And so every once in a while I get out my, you know, chicken baby food, you know, and mix it in with a little smooth move tea or a little of that herbs, and, and uh, she loves it, eats it up, and then, boy, do we have some action after that. So... <laughs> So those are wonderful herbs. So if you have, you know, sometimes if I have gone out to a potluck or something and I've had a bunch of junk, you know, and I just think, okay, I'll come home and make myself a cup of tea and in the morning, mm -hmm. poof, it's all out of there. So that's just one thought. And of course the active ingredient, and that's also in aloe, aloe vera, which is fabulous for the colon. I've heard stories of people with really um, severe colon pain where you can actually, you know, in insert the aloe vera up into the anus, into the rectum and bring tremendous relief from all kinds of problems. Just, you know, a moment's relief sometimes is just such a blessing from a really difficult situation. And so what is the active ingredient in these is it's a phyto plant, chemical, phytochemical, which is emodin, E-M-O-D-I-N. And what that does is it causes contractions. It will make that colon move. Mm. So even if there's a lot of hard old plaque in there that's sort of stuck, it'll get things happening. So there we go. <laughs> Literally. Now, um, <laughs> so now, you know, if people think, well, okay, so Josephine, what is a proper poop? After all, let's just talk about it a little bit. So some people say, well, golden floaters, you know, that's really the best. You want to have those nice golden floaters that float in the toilet bowl, and they're well-formed. We always talk about well-formed poops, you know. Got news for you. The people who have studied poop around the world, and there are people who do, which is, I think, kind of an amazing, what a subject, you know. Yes, I think I'll go to China and study poop. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, off they go, and they find that the people who have the native diets, who are eating, uh, you know, a traditional diet that they've lived on for centuries, uh, the, that that the uh, the instead of what we think here in the United States, oh, one time a day, yes, I'm regular, mm-hmm, that's good. 
well, actually, that's not really so good. That's kind of a little substandard because the people who have a natural diet that have been um, eating a lot of, of course, they're eating a lot of plant-based plant -based diet, they're going to be having three poops a day, right? And it makes perfect sense if you think about it. Food goes in, food comes out, right? You know, it's a quicker transit. Things are happening. And um, that's, you know, a lot more poops happening than once a day. Once a day means 365 poops a year. Okay, three times a day, seven days a week, for, you know, 52 weeks, that's over a thousand. That's a lot. And I had this one friend in high school whose parents were both health nuts, and her mom used to say that there were the three great pleasures in life. Mastication, fornication, and defecation. <laughs> and, you know, why would you want to miss out? So... <laughs> All that nice satisfaction. So, <laughs> so how do we get that? Well, vegetables for breakfast, vegetables for lunch, and vegetables for dinner. Now, I would say also fruits, but then we're getting our glycemic levels a little high, right? And if we have weight, that'll hold the weight on too. So really, it's vegetables. So Frank and I, we switched over to vegetables for breakfast, vegetables for lunch, and vegetables for dinner, oh, well, maybe a half a decade or a decade ago. Because we're in our 60s now. And of course, you, know, you can get away with a whole lot when you're 20. You know, we used to have, you know, I don't know, butterfly cut French toast stuffed with jam for breakfast with a few eggs and some sausages or whatever, you know. No, 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 no. Those days are long gone because we eat like that now. We're going to be paying for it on the other end. So we just don't do that anymore. So we get up, we make our green juice. We might have a miso soup with vegetables snipped into it, you know. For lunch, what do we have? Oh, let's have some celery and sliced bell pepper and maybe some nut butter and, you know, I don't know, a date, you know, something like that. And then dinner, well, oh, let's splurge and have a cooked vegetable, you know, because... <laughs> <laughs> because... Um, cooked vegetables are just a little, a little more broken down. They're easier to digest, but they're also not as alkalizing. And so now we're going to leave this topic where we can slide easily into middle age and go into another one, which is um, uh, going to take us round the bend to acid alkaline, which is where the cooked vegetables come in, because that's a little more acidifying, and raw vegetables are a little more alkalizing. But first of all, I wanted to just talk quickly about a wonderful experience that I had about 10 years ago, which was, ta-da, a symptom-free menopause. How many of you have heard about a symptom-free menopause? Not very, Not very many, okay? So, how did I do it? It was actually a piece of cake. So, I gave up alcohol about 20 years ago, maybe 40 years ago now, I don't know, remember, but I was like, oh, okay, if I'm going to get my calories, I'd rather get them for, from cream. <laughs> That's just the truth of who I am. So, you know, I gave up the, the beer and the wine, all right? And then chocolate, you know, okay, a little too much getting me too high, a little too much bzzz, always comes with sugar, right? Nah, better give that up too. And then, um, so chocolate, sugar, alcohol, um, those have got to go. And they did. And they were pretty much out of my life for at least 10 years before I went into menopause. So just about every book you read on menopause, they all say try to reduce that. Well, if you can eliminate it, much better. Also really increased my breast health because I used to have, you know, many people will have some little nodules and things in there that are actually quite normal, but the little fiber, fib, fiber, little fi, fibrous areas, all that went away too as soon as I got done with the chocolate and the sugar and the alcohol. Now, I'm not a saint and I would occasionally have a binge here and there. Not a bad binge, not bad enough to kill me, thank God, but, <laughs> but a little binge, you know. But I would get a hold of it pretty quick because I have a love-hate relationship with this stuff. I like it a lot, taste-wise, but if I take it for more than two or three days, especially coffee, I would also add that in there, caffeine, I forgot to mention caffeine, then I start losing sleep. My body, my teacher, right? It's like, damn, here I am awake again. Gee, why could that be? Could it be the chocolate bar I had every day for the last three days? Gee, I don't know, you know, <laughs> or that cup of coffee or whatever. So those are the things that adversely affect our bodies, and our bodies will tell us about it. So almost every case of really chronic insomnia that I've come across, if you clean up that colon so that there's clean blood going to the brain and you stop 
the caffeine and the sugar, ta-da, all clears up. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and they sleep like a baby in no time at all. So those are just some thoughts there as well. So then the other thing um, that uh, started to happen to me when I first had my menopause was a heavy bleeding, right? And I had a friend who had heavy bleeding for a whole year. Mm -hmm. A whole year! She wound up anemic at the end of it. And her doctor wasn't able to do anything for her. But um, I talked to a naturopathic friend of mine, and she said, gee, why don't you try a few little tricks of the trade? So um, the first one was shepherd's purse. Mm -hmm. So shepherd's purse is a nice herb. It grows all over California. It's a weed. It's got this little tiny, looks like a little purse. And it's called shepherd's purse because the shepherds used to keep it in their purse, their little leather pouch that they had, because it will stop bleeding. Mm -hmm. And you can take the shepherd's purse and put it right on. You can chew it up and put it on. It's great for if there's a big injury. And so I would take this, uh, if I started to have a period that was going too long, I would just go ahead and take two, three dropperfuls, a little later, some more, and I was able to control that. And then this other uh, nice homeopathic herb, Sabina, was a great one. And I would advise if you have that kind of a problem going into menopause, talk to a naturopath about these two herbs. They're just amazing um, for going ahead and controlling that kind of problem. And then, of course, during menopause, what happens to, as our estrogen levels drop, right? They really go down. But our progesterone levels just go right through the floor. And if you can keep those two moving together in harmony, you're not going to have symptoms. But if one of them gets out of harmony, whew, boy, things just happen like crazy. So in steps wild yam, right? Progesterone. Now, they said at the time when I was going through menopause, oh, you have to have these specific patented wild yam creams. Mm -hmm. I thought, I don't know. I'd heard that the women in South America were, you know, just eating the wild yam straight up. And then when the American market got to be so big for wild yam, they sent all their wild yams up to us and they started eating sweet potatoes. I thought, you know, I'm just going to try some wild yam extracts. So that's what I did. It worked like a charm. And then uh, Chase Tree Vitex, also known as monk's pepper, because the, it would help the monks with keeping their testosterone levels low. This is the great hormonal balancer. Hmm. So you want to get those two levels going together, the Vitex does it. And I started making my own. I have a friend who uh, at the time had a beautiful big uh, chaste tree. You just collect the berries, put them in a little alcohol. I like to put up my herbs on the new moon. So I'd start them on a new moon. Two weeks later, the alcohol is nice and dark with that Vitex has now given all of its goodness, all of its phytochemicals, all of its alkaloids have been given into the alcohol. A couple of dropperfuls of that, two or three times a year. And, uh, you know, it was just a piece of cake. If I had any kind of symptoms, I just used my herbs to kind of help balance it a little bit. So those symptoms immediately went away. Ta-da! No problem. It was great. I loved it. I was really worried, too, because, you know, my mom went through horrible night sweats and sweating, and I'm not necessarily a modest person, and I thought, you know, this could be really bad, <laughs> so I've got to do something about this. I've got to get very proactive here <laughs> so we don't wind up in trouble, and it worked. And then, of course, Dr. Schultz, my friend and favorite teacher there, he has his female formula. It's got all those same herbs in it, plus a little extra just to kind of soften things and make it a little nicer mood swings and stuff. And he also has a good one called Fem Plus for uh, the menstrual cycle, so that easing that whole situation. So um, there was one other situation that I noticed with, um, with my menopause, which was that suddenly my brain just left. It was like it happened one day, and it was gone for several months, maybe six months, about anything that I wasn't really interested in. So Greco-Roman politics or history or something, it's like, I couldn't tell you the first thing about current events or anything, but talk to me about natural health or horses or gardening, whew, I was all over it. And I figured, you know, this is my brain and my hormonal system taking me into my wisdom years and letting me know my path. <laughs> because where I was passionate, I had plenty of energy and I could speak beautifully. But where I wasn't really all that interested, I was stumbling over my words, I couldn't remember words, it was terrible. So it was a little bit of a handicap. So I did go ahead and I got a few nice things. So Dr. Schultz, of course, his brain formula, I was using that. 
And these two, acetyl L-carnitine and alpha lipoic acid. Very nice brain combination. And I just found out about this from the healthy food store or some other source, and I just started taking a couple a day. And then there's another one which I looked in my herbal apothecary that I have at home. And all of us should have an herbal apothecary so that if something comes up, we have stuff around. You know, like I think every one of us should always have activated willow charcoal capsules on hand because you get that little bit of food poisoning. Or you take that willow, it's just like straining the water from our kitchen sink. The willow pulls out the bacteria and the molds and the funguses and you're much better. So, you know, that first little feeling of like, oh gosh, what have I done? Take a little handful of activated willow charcoal and ding, you're all better. So, and of course, I should give a little disclaimer here because everybody is different and so really consult your doctor first for all of these things, you know, <laughs> but, but it's also good to be empowered and to know what your own, as you go along this lines and working with a naturopath or alternative practitioners or with your medical doctor, if he or she is educated in these things, then you can get better and better at taking care of your own self. And, and having those things at home, on hand, ready to go is a great thing. So I have a full apothecary, and you know, friends will come over, they're like, Josephine, what do I do? You know, this is a problem. You know, oh, here, you know, here's this, try this. You know, just pay me back, bring me back another bottle, or whatever. And hopefully it'll work for them. So that's just another little aside. So empowering ourselves with our, uh, our own choices here. And let's see. Oh yeah, the other one I was gonna mention was Gink Gold by Nature's Way. They've done a lot of tests on, gink, on gink gold. Now, ginkgo in general, ginkgo biloba, the ginkgo leaf, we can grow that here. It was felt to be extinct. It was in the paleobotanical record, but it, we didn't have any here until we got into Red China in like the 50s. It started, mm -hmm. we found it growing around the monasteries. And it is a beautiful brain herb. It does cross the blood-brain barrier, so it will enter into the brain. Now, the problem is, is if that herb hasn't been handled well, if the herb was moldy, or if the herb was sprayed in transit or fumigated, those poisons will come with it into mm -hmm. the brain. <coughs> so you want to get very good quality gink ginkgo. I would never buy ginkgo at a miscellaneous department store. Yes? Can I ask you if there's any food you can eat uh, good for the brain? Oh yeah, well, so definitely here comes in our cold fishes. Very good for the brain. I had a very severe brain injury and at the time I was a vegan, and I started dreaming about scallops. <laughs> By the third dream on scallops, I thought, I'm going to go out and get some scallops and eat them. <laughs> and then I had a little bit of cold fish as well. So fish is a very good brain. Um, it's a very you mean good cold brain. water fish? Cold water fish, yeah. Mm -hmm, like Alaskan cod or whatever. Um, and then, of course, ginkgo, that herb, is wonderful for the brain. And then just cleaning up the body. And so eating a lot of vegetables in your diet is also great for the brain. And we're going to get into that in quite, quite some little detail in just a second or two here. So I better move on because I want to get into that. So let me just give a quick check to see if there's anything I wanted to miss. Well, we might have to just skip that part. <laughs> Come back. Because, yeah, because what I want to talk about now is the miracle of osteoporosis. Now people think, what? The miracle of osteoporosis? Yes, it is a miracle because... What happens when we're eating that standard American diet, which is very acidifying, right? We are not getting uh, the, there is a, what's called bioavailability, which means that there's a range of pH where your body can absorb nutrients, right? And it's very specific. The blood pH has to be right around 7.5. Anything too much lower than that, 6, or too much higher than that, 8, you're not going to be able to take up those nutrients. So let's say you're eating the standard American diet, which is going to acidify your body, and sometimes I've you know, heard of people with pH as low as three, okay, or five is quite common, or six, or four is not too uncommon. Then you're not going to be able to take up the nutrients, and you're going to have this acid blood moving around your body, right? Now if this acid blood goes to the brain, poof, where you go, right? That's going to kill you, or to your other vital organs. So what the body does in its tremendous wisdom is it takes this ample bone that we have and it mines the bone to buffer the blood. Because when you're, you know, basic chemistry, when you have an acid or an alkaline, you can buffer it with a salt, right? And calcium is a salt. So it takes the calcium to buffer the blood so that your brain doesn't get poisoned by too much acidic blood. So it saves us. It's saving our lives all the time. Our bodies are amazing. They're constantly working for us. And so here's some... Um, 
there's the base, that's the, the, so, and then there's the dairy myth. So that people think, oh, well, I need calcium. I better eat some dairy because calcium, dairy is high in calcium. Well, unfortunately, dairy is also high in protein. I mean, it's great that it's high in protein, but it, it we need uh, calcium to digest protein. The actual act of digesting the protein requires calcium. And so if you are eating dairy products, though they are high in calcium, the protein requirement for the calcium is so high that there's not enough calcium in the dairy to meet the needs for digesting the dairy. So when you eat dairy, you actually wind up with a calcium deficit. Now the mm. dairy industry, I guarantee you, would not necessarily want you to know that because they're like, oh, high in calcium, and yes, it is high in calcium, but it's not going to take care of that problem. It's not going to let you digest the protein. So where do you get your calcium? Bones. This is a hint. <laughs> Dark leafy greens, a great source of calcium. That's not too high in, in protein. Now they are high, they do have some protein. The protein in, these, in this kale here is about 4%. That's about the same amount of protein that you're going to find in mother's milk. <coughs> now when would a human body have the greatest need for protein? Probably in infancy, because what does protein do? It builds new tissues. So there's probably no time in the human body and the human life other than say if you're a marathon runner or something where you're going to need that much protein. So there's this real myth about protein in our culture. We think, oh my god, I need protein to, you know, I'm feeling tired. It's it, Largely that is psych psychosomatic. We don't actually need that much protein. And the protein that we're getting, we're getting plenty in our fruits and vegetables for the most part. Now, you know, I'm not going to be opposed if somebody wants to have a little extra proteins through, you know, animal products or whatever, but the idea here is just to keep it minimal. In fact, if we were wild people, and we were walking, you know, maybe 500 years ago from Los Angeles to New York, because most people were nomadic, what would we be eating? Well, we would pick stuff along the way, right? We'd be picking you know, some kale and some collards, we'd be having some greens, dark leafy greens predominantly. Maybe once or twice a week, somebody would bag a squirrel, right? We'd throw that in the soup. Yeah, that's enough, you know, that's enough. We don't need so much huge amounts of protein. And one of the things that they've found out with um, burn victims is that when there's that much damage, a huge amount of damaged protein is released into the blood, and then that goes to the kidneys, and it blocks the kidneys, and that's why burn victims will die, is from excess protein dumped into the blood. So we got to be careful about this protein thing. We've really been sold a bill of goods by people who have vested interests in that. There's whole industries that are like, yes, eat protein, the dairy industry, whatnot, whatnot. Lots of people are trying to get us to eat a lot of protein. And we really are getting too much. And that old caveman image of, yes, you know, let's go out and eat meat, they found that that's completely false. There's really no basis to that whole ideology. It was much more of an egalitarian society. And if you look at the primates, the large primates, like say gorillas, what do they eat? They're big and strong. They're eating greens, right? They're walking around the forest, they're picking the leaves. So I think we want to kind of return back to that a little bit. And another thing that I like to say is that if we were visiting the farm tables of our great grandmothers, you know, what would be on the table there? They're not going to kill the cow all the time because that's way too expensive of a food. They need those animals for other things, right? You're going to be working the garden. That's what you're going to be eating. When I was growing up, my grandmother Josephine, she had a garden about the size of this area here that she could feed six people all year on that garden. Because we all know how the garden is. Frank and I have two little vegetable boxes. We're eating out of them every day. We're juicing out of them. We're eating out. We're picking stuff all every day, salads and juices and things. So just another little vote there for um, our vegetables. Eat our vegetables. So, and the foods that block calcium absorption, of course, sugar, caffeine, chocolate, <coughs> coffee, alcohol, tobacco, stress will also, and animal foods. And then the foods that leach calcium from our bodies, well, soda and high phosphate foods like animal products. So, um, and then we have an increased calcium need if we take things like antibiotics and prescription drugs like corticosteroids. So, for calcium, don't think cheese. <laughs> think <laughs> vegetables and get plenty of them. And be sure that you're getting your, your pH levels right. So here are, I brought these two little pH test strips. You can 
you know, do the morning urine or you can do the morning saliva. The urine and the saliva are slightly different than the blood, um, but is easy enough to take care of it. So you basically want to go for somewhere in the middle range, somewhere closer. If you're getting really dark, like you're in too much alkaline or too acid, then you're going to want to change your diet accordingly so that you can have your nutrients be available to you and not wind up with osteoporosis. So that's that little story there. And I see we're getting very close to the time, so I'm going to... But it is the elephant in the room that nobody talks about, right? <laughs> pH for osteoporosis. Yes? Well, so the pH and your urine and saliva, is that really comparable to in your blood? I mean, Yeah. So the blood pH is, uh, the optimum blood pH for bioavailability is 7.4 to mm -hmm. 7.5. That's a very narrow range. That translates in the urine to 6.4 to 6.8. Okay, a little broader range. And I think in the saliva, it's even a little slightly broader than that. So, so if you're close, then you're, you're doing pretty good with that. Yeah. So now I think we're at the witching hour. So I better open things up for questions real quickly. Yeah, go ahead. I'm wondering if I'm getting enough fiber um, when I'm using my, the vegetables in the Nutribullet. Yeah. Pulverizing yes, yes. Versus eating the vegetable, I'm getting the same amount of fiber. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. You're getting tons of fiber that way okay. with the Nutribullet. It's a great question. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And you are also getting the fiber with juice. So if you're straining it, you're not getting as quite as much bulk, but you are getting the soluble fibers. Okay. Those soluble fibers. Think of a blueberry, one of the highest foods in soluble fiber. There's not a lot there. You know, blueberry juice is loaded with sol soluble fiber. Any other questions? Yes. I was just wondering if um, coconut kefir water, if that's um, Constipating, does that mean that it's not a good fat for me or not a good source? So everybody's going to be a little different. So different foods are going to be constipating to, do, to different people. So if that is constipating to you, then that's not something that you probably want to do much of. You want to find something that keeps you nice and regular. Yeah. But in general, coconut kefir water is not a constipating food for most people. Anybody else? Yes? And do you use or recommend coconut oil? Oh, absolutely. Coconut oil is fabulous for us, yeah. It's great for cooking with if you're going to do cooking because it can really take the high temperatures without going, without damaging the oil, unlike some foods. And, and another food that I think that's a good food for people, though it's an animal product, is butter. I do feel that it's good because it's got a very healthy essential fatty acid balance. Yeah. Any other questions? How about olive oil? I love olive oil, and that's <laughs> something that people have been, you would have found olive oil on your great-grandmother's table. It would have been there along with the butter and a lot of vegetables and very little meats. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes? Uh, calcium supplement is not necessary if you're eating your... Yeah. Well, and also, too, if you're not in the bioavailable range, right, if your pH is way low or too even too high, you're not even going to be able to absorb it. It's just going to pass right through the body. But this is a much more available form for your calcium. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh. Yes. Doctors are now urging people to drink lots of coffee. Yeah. Well, to follow the money. It? Okay. So you got to follow the money. So <laughs> it's true. And chocolate and the same thing. So if um, if you were the coffee board, let's say, and suddenly you'd notice that uh, income was plummeting. Um, you might hire a, si a scientist and say, look, I will pay you, you know, $500,000 if you'll find a really good, healthy thing about coffee, right? Mm -hmm. So I think always with these things, we want to follow the money and take a look at who had a vested interest in coming up with those articles. And yeah, I'm sure, you know, there were people who came forth, remember 40 years ago, who said, cigarette smoking, it's good for you. It relaxes you. Remember those ads? They were in magazines. No, we want to do this. It's good. So just always pay attention to where the source of the information is coming from. <laughs> what about beet greens? Beet greens are fabulous. We have them in our juice every morning. They're just wonderful. Thank so you. delicious. And in salad's great too. Well, thank you very much, everybody. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you, Thank you for your insights. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. I hope they were helpful. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yes. um, so um, thank you guys for coming. Ooh.